In the spirit of fostering and supporting learning through the generation and sharing of knowledge, the University of Louisville Cultural Center would like to acknowledge that the land we're meeting on today is the original homeland of the Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land which we gather on. Um, I guess, Dr. Phillips, if you'd like to start as the moderator, just give us a little bit of an intro about yourself. I, from a, the reservation in Lac du Flambeau, Wisconsin, which if you know are familiar with Wisconsin at all, you go to Madison and it's straight up north. It's almost up to the UP. A lot of people think, well, you're really close to Canada, but there's a little bit of Wisconsin. Then there's the UP, which is rather big. And then there's Lake Superior and then there's Canada. So, but we're closer to Canada than comparatively speaking than here. So, and I teach mostly writing in the communication department at the University of Louisville. Every now and then I get to teach a Native American studies class. And then I also take my students to my reservation. It was pre-COVID of course, but we would go for a spring break service learning trip now and then. So, and maybe we should start by allowing everyone else who's on the panel to introduce themselves, if they don't mind. Would that be okay? Ladies Please. first. Please, Michelle. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am Michelle Hale. I am Navajo, Laguna, Chippewa, and Odawa. Um, I was born and raised on the Navajo Reservation, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University in American Indian Studies, where I teach reservation economic development, federal Indian policy, and uh, indigenous community-based planning. Um, and so I've been kind of working in this space for a number of years now, um, and particularly excited about the work uh, because my home community at Navajo Nation has been grappling with land use issues and um, really just trying to figure out how to be more empowered in terms of the way we do community planning. Um, so I think there's a, a strong connection between what we do here on campus um, and the community. Um, here at ASU, we have um, about 3000 indigenous students across campus and uh, the students in our American Indian Studies um, department are um, from represent tribes uh, mostly across the all across the southwest um, but occasionally indigenous communities elsewhere um, in the country or or even first nations communities so thank you so much for the invitation today i'm looking forward to our discussion tough it out which one first okay um I am currently in Athens, Georgia. I go to UGA. I am an international business and marketing major. Um, and I'm also the founding treasurer of our Native American Students Association. We just started last semester. We've actually put together a lot of great events and uh, thank you, I, I appreciate the, the support. Um, we put together a lot of great events in a short amount of time and um, we're looking to do even bigger things next year. Excellent, thank you, Max. Um, Dr. Ron Sheffield, I am the program director, executive in residence, uh, clinical assistant professor uh, in the um, human resources and organization development within the School of Education. Um, our program is online. I'm talking to you from speaking to you from Virginia today, and uh, we reach across the entire country and many of our students are across the globe. Uh, I'm Quetzan. I'm a member of the Quetzan tribe of Fort Yuma, Arizona, and uh, we're part of the Kumeyaay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as time goes on uh, tonight and, uh, and just discuss it a little bit more. Um, I tend to teach uh, organizational behavior topics. Uh, I tend to teach um, organization development, but I'm specifically interested in the behavioral piece as it ties back to tribes. Uh, so I tend to um, stay in that stay in that space and I really enjoy it. And I too, Michelle, want to, to mirror your words. I, I'm grateful for the invitation and thankful to be here with you all. Well, our first question that 
has been posed that we ask is how do you identify? And you have all brought up something about your identity, but maybe you'd like to share something a little bit further about that. So let's start with Michelle. Is there anything further that you'd like to share about that with your identity? Well, I, I think, and maybe we'll get into enrollment and blood quantum issues in our discussion, um, but I think, uh, you know, for Navajo Nation, we have a blood quantum requirement, which is one quarter in, I think it's uh, a lot of what we hear from our students kind of across many communities is there's a lot of conversation currently about blood quantum because um, when I was growing up, I think it was, I, I had a, a different identity because I was not full-blooded Navajo on the Navajo reservation. Um, and we're actually one of the communities where you still see a lot of full-blooded um, Navajo individuals. However, I know that's not the case in a lot of other places. And, you know, it's, it, the, with what I see with a lot of our students is it's, it's not even so much anymore where you have students like myself who represent three, four or five different indigenous communities, but um, you know, it's their identity is indigenous and something else, either they're African American, they're Asian, they're Latino, um, you know, uh, just all these different identities. And I think we're at a point where our communities are grappling with how do we, um, how do we address that in terms of blood quantum um, in, you know, I know blood quantum can be controversial in a lot of our communities. And um, I, so, so I think there's this weird juxtaposition with the blood quantum kind of bureaucratic piece of it, but there's the other kind of lived experience and the way we as indigenous people kind of think of ourselves culturally. Um, and that's where the identity I think can mean very different things to different people. Sometimes it's based on language, sometimes it's based on where you grew up or whether you participate in ceremony, how much you know about your history. Um, so I think it's, um, you know, in, in regard to all of that with my own identity, I would have to say that I feel mostly Navajo and Laguna <laughs> because I grew up on the Navajo reservation and very much um, close to my family um, on both the Laguna and Navajo side of my family. But in terms of the Odawa and Chippewa family um, who are from Michigan, um, you know, I, I know very little about that part of my family's um, history. So um, my grandmother was orphaned in part of the residential school process um, back in the day. And so it just kind of feels like there's a gap in terms of that connection and understanding um, with regard to the, um, you know, the Chippewa Odawa side of the family. So I, I think that's, you know, it's complex. And I think there's more to it certainly than, than blood quantum. Thank you, Michelle. So, um, is, do you go by Maximilian or Theron? Uh, my, I go by Maximilian or Max. Okay. Uh, Max. Whichever, whichever one you want to go with is fine with okay. me. Um, did yeah, so I am enrolled Wichita, uh, but I'm also part Caddo, Seminole, and Narragansett. Um, and I absolutely agree. I think it's a very complex thing um, to identify uh, between, you know, the different aspects of your heritage. Absolutely. Um, if I had to say, I'd probably say I'm most connected to the, the Wichita and Caddo side. Uh, my mom grew up around the Anadarko area of Oklahoma, so there's a pretty large population there. Um, and that's a lot of what she grew up with and learned about. Um, so that's really what was carried on to me most. Um, I love doing genealogy. It's a great hobby of mine. Um, so I'm constantly learning and I'm trying to learn more about the other uh, sides of my heritage as I can. Okay, Ron. Thank you, Celine. Uh, Rebecca and I talked about this early on, just so you're all aware. So I'm gonna be a little controversial on purpose um, and shouldn't shock anyone, especially the native people on the phone. Um, the reason why I brought up blood quantum as a second bullet was as Rebecca and I were talking is because this is one of those topics that is incredibly sensitive. And what I have found in my 53 years is that it's only sensitive to people who don't have it. 
that that's when it gets sensitive is when uh, if you don't have blood quantum. Uh, I, my mom is full blood. And my dad, pure Italian. He came here when he was 19 years old. So I am I did the DNA myself and that little pie chart that gets created. It is the creepiest thing in the world to see mine split right down the middle. 50% native and 50% Italian. It's a cra- plus you see me, right? I'm doing the uh, anyhow. anyhow. Um, it's uh, it's really interesting to see. And uh, and for those of you who aren't aware, like most cultures, when you're raised by, when your mom uh, is indigenous, you're indigenous. That's at least in my tribe. And our tribe, like most tribes, are matriarchies. And, uh, and it's a quiet matriarchy. You don't see it on TV. You won't see... Um, usually you'll see the epitome of, a, oftentimes a male chief, but most of the, especially in our tribe. But what, what I found during my own studies is that with most tribes, that male chief was put there by the oldest females in the tribe. So it's a really interesting uh, position to, to be in. And, uh, I identify very plainly as just simply me. I, 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 I've watched my lifetime, the uh, identification thing move and I've had my own, you know, struggles with what that looks like, and how I perceive myself and uh, and seem to the rest of the world. But I've landed comfortably at around the age of 42 or so with I'm I identify simply as just me, and I'm comfortable with that, and that's really what matters to me. So I hope that didn't make anybody too squirmish, but at the same time, I do hope you squirm just a tad. <laughs> well, if we look at how the blood quantum. Uh, happened historically tribes uh, pre-contact the tribes didn't have a blood quantum if you were you were either included in the tribe by practice and culture and like things like michelle was saying before whether or not you participated and were a member of the community or or you weren't so the blood quantum many people think was created simply to try to get rid of native americans so it's it has this very precarious history behind it with the intention of exterminating us as a people. So um, I, I'm an enrolled member of the Ojibwe Nation, and Ojibwe is uh, the word that that we use to call Anishinaabe people. And today, probably most Americans would be more familiar with the word Chippewa. But around Wisconsin, they don't use that as much. They'll use it sometimes, but mostly they use the, the word Ojibwe. And like Michelle, we have a blood quantum of, of I think it's a quarter now, but it, it it's precarious, it's political. It, it uh, There are many things about it that aren't desirable and uh, user-friendly. There are many, many problems with it, so. Could, could I make a quick comment, Celine? Please do. There are there are four people, and this is for the audience, for the for the students in the room. There are four people on this call who are enrolled tribal members, and I, I'd like for you just to take note how rare this is. This is extremely extremely rare to have four enrolled tribal members um, discussing uh, our own culture. I, I just it, it dawned on me, Celine, as you were speaking, how rare this truly is. I've been on many of these, as you all have, and. Most of the time, uh, most of the panel is are not enrolled tribal members, so I just wanted to take a minute to show complete respect for that. Especially where we're located now, we are all in different areas, but geographically right now, but representing and being on the campus of University of Louisville. I've been here since 2004, and I think there was only one other time when there were this many native people and there was a native function and they were they were visiting so to be have this many involved in a function at university at the university of louisville is is quite something it's 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 nice it's a blessing it's good absolutely so. i mean we have a very similar thing at here at the university of georgia i mean there's not very many of us that are enrolled here um among the faculty and also among the students um and that's been uh, a thing within our student organization as well is a lot of the members are not enrolled um, simply because you just they're just not around um, in these areas in that high of concentration. And to to me maybe even be a, even more controversial, a lot of times there are many 
schools or places that that want to be inclusive and include all indigenous people, which is fine. I'm all in favor of that. However, sometimes that might cause us to overlook the fact that there are four of us here whose nation has a different relationship with the United States federal government. So um, our, our treaties and the way our ancestors, the things that they did to have us be where we're at right now, it is a big thing. It, it took a lot. It, it took a lot of survival skills. It took a lot of work. It, it, it continuously takes a lot of work. It's not something that, that we can just take for granted, but it's something that there are still people who wish that there were no Ojibwe in the state of Wisconsin and that they wish they would go away. So it's still something that that Native people have to deal with and work and work with. And I'm sure it's similar. I'm seeing everyone else's head nod. It's I'm not the only one who whose tribe has to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So if uh, I can if I can just add and not to go too far off on a tangent, I, I think that's that's that what you're talking about is an interesting dynamic here in Arizona because we're actually in a state where tribes control or we govern about a quarter of the land within the state. You know, there are a lot of reservations here. There are 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona. Um, however, um, we manage to still be an invisible uh, part of, of the population in a lot of cases. Um, you know, the census tells us that we have um, thousands of indigenous people, self-identified indigenous people here in Phoenix. But, um, you know, it unless you seek out a, an Indian center or you go to a powwow or an Indian event, um, there's a good chance that you're not just kind of going to activities or kind of around town doing your shopping and necessarily running into people that, you know, are kind of obviously indigenous. And even that's tricky on its on its own and controversial. But I, I think, um, you know, sometimes I think the assumption might be if you're in a state where you have a lot of tribes and tribes have a lot of land within that jurisdiction, that there might be better invis better visibility or there might be uh, maybe that chance for tribes to wield a little bit of that political power in terms of things happening on the state level. And um, that's not always the case. Um, we, we still manage to have to fight extra hard to get the attention of voters or the state legislature on a lot of our issues and really kind of depending on the politics of the day and who's serving as governor or in the legislature. Um, they're all uphill battles in on really important issues, everything from water to um, air quality issues to gaming compacts. Um, it, it's, you know, that state relationship is really important. And even though there are a lot of us here in our state, um, you know, the, the, the battle is still significant. <laughs> I'm gonna add a question here because the state of Wisconsin requires students in grade school to be, uh, they have to have a chapter. They have to spend some time on Native American studies. They don't in Indiana and they don't in Kentucky. I'm wondering about the states that you're, you are in and whether or not, and it's still contentious, even though it's a requirement in Wisconsin, there are many people who don't want that to happen. I look at it as a good thing because again, if we don't mandate some of it, there will be no understanding of how did Black Bee Flambeau exist and, and why is it there and why is what is this relationship between the federal government and my tribe? And I think that's equally important where you guys are from. So do you want to, anybody else want to share what your state and tribe have experienced in that category of education? Yeah, well, I'm, I was born and raised here in Georgia, so the state of Georgia does not really have a relationship with the, with the Wichita affiliated tribes, of course. Um, but, you know, being born and raised here, of course, I went through the elementary school system here and everything, and there wasn't really any intentional teaching about it other than maybe like, you know, the basic story of like Thanksgiving and doing a, a small school play about it. 
Um, yeah, I can't really recall anything that was that was intentionally um, about the history of the of the region. Um, now, once we got into high school, um, there was there was definitely more more detail and more discussion about um, things like the Trail of Tears, of course, in the state of Georgia. Um, but early on in elementary school, there, there wasn't really anything to that effect. Nothing about Sequoia or the Cherokee people or the um, the the first major case Georgia v. Um, Worcester. That, yeah, nothing yeah. nothing about that. Yeah, I don't recall anything uh, personally. I mean, the closest thing I can think. I'm actually from Cherokee County, Georgia, too. Um, and you know, our school mascot. I went to Hickory Flat Elementary School. Was the Thunderbirds even? And they, there was nothing. There, there was no, um, no discussion of that. Um, and you know, you see it in like the local place names and stuff. You know, like Cherokee County. The high school I went to was actually called Sequoia High School. Um, but you know, there wasn't really that. Why is it named that? Kind of like what you were saying uh, with with your nation, right? It's like why why is this here? Why are these names here? There was no discussion about it at the end of the day, which is really unfortunate. Ron? Um, happy to. I'm trying to temper my words, by the way. I'm playing it off in my head. Just I'm literally running through my head. So nice, nice question, Celine. Um, so I'm in Virginia. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there is no mandated discussion or teaching of indigenous tribes at all. Um, and that shouldn't surprise anyone. What I'm more, what I went to fast, Celine, was your question is such an enticing fish line, right? The hook is just too beautiful there. Um, is regardless of whether it's being forced to to be taught or not in a public school system, in my mind is is not necessarily the biggest topic. The biggest topic is what you're teaching, right? It's almost the reason why I say that is because um, I've given so many different lectures and in, uh, in Indian country across the country, I've been so blessed to be invited to speak that um, one of the things I've noticed is that. Um, students, probably many of the students who are listening today, only got one tiny little increment or discussion about indigenous tribes here. And the reason for that, I believe wholeheartedly, is because we want to believe Native people are romanticized ideas at this point. Uh, Max really nailed a lot of this discussion just simply with, in my opinion, with what the list he went through. Most of what we move through during the course of a day has an indigenous name tied to it, all the way down to the road that you used to drive to go to school today was very probably a trail at some point, not shockingly, that you know was used by one of our peeps. So um, that's a very difficult thing to digest when when you're um, when you don't have that affiliation, right? That's tough because it makes it makes our nation look look into a, a a mirror and it's it's not a pretty scene right we don't we don't want to have that conversation therefore we don't really we don't we just simply look the other way and um you know we're okay with somebody wearing um you know a pocahontas outfit at halloween uh, you know we make up thousands of excuses as to why that's okay and that ties back and then i'll be quiet so sorry celine you did it um michelle you brought up earlier the, the comment around, you know, why we still fight to, and you used the word fight, and I loved it, why we still fight to be heard. I also think part of this is cultural, because from my research and my tribe, I can only speak from my perspective, we're, we're taught, like most, I've learned most tribal people are taught that if you're too proud, and proud is the word I've heard many times, that it's not respected. So it's tough to be a little bit prideful and say, hey, you know what? Hey, it's not cool that you took another thousand acres of our land because you found a mineral under the ground. That's not cool. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go hire a slew of lawyers and we're going to have fun here for the next 10 years. So but we don't we don't say that as loudly as some cultures do. Some cultures are better at that than we are and they're louder, faster and that squeaky wheel truly does get the grease in this case. And I think, Michelle, that might be why uh, maybe our culture doesn't always get heard. And we do have to fight harder sometimes because 
there's just you know less than two percent or right around two percent of the population our voice is uh, sometimes squished pretty fast so sorry to me Celine I took us to down another road but I thought it was all right all right all right Michelle did you have something you wanted to add on along those lines Sure, I, I can go back to the, the education in our school system question. Um, here in Arizona, I, I think it's um, been interesting that for probably more than 20 years, we've had indigenous state legislators who have really been um, year after year would introduce bills um, to to mandate um, some aspect of indigenous history into the, the Arizona state K through 12 curriculum. And um, over, we're a state where the, the governorship and the state legislature over the years have been largely controlled by Republicans. And um, our, our indigenous state legislators typically are, are Democrats. And so just the politics of it are such that um, those bills to try to incorporate some aspect of indigenous history into the curriculum um, just cannot gain any traction. And it's been um, kind of a nonstop <laughs> battle on the part of those legislators to try to make that happen. I forget what year, but it's um, been, I want to say, in the last five years where, well, because the politics in our state are slowly starting to to change. I mean, there's not everybody agrees, but some will say that our state is starting to turn purple. And um, one of the changes we see is there's been more of a willingness to advance some of this um, incorporation of indigenous history into our K through 12 curriculum. Although it kind of went from, you know, the original propo proposal was kind of like this in terms of indigenous history, a class in indigenous sovereignty, something about tribal government, um, but it got whittled down to, okay, there's a small section on um, indigenous history. And, you know, depending on how you look at it, uh, I suppose it's a victory to some degree, but it's not the full, um, it, it's not the full proposal or the, the you know, I think the depth of the curriculum that was initially um, suggested. So um, I, I think in terms of curriculum on reservations, however, um, through some um, MOUs and other agreements that tribes have made with the state, there's that opportunity to do some of that curriculum for a res community. Um, but, you know, a lot of folks will say that in order to address some of the stereotypes or misunderstanding um, you know, around Indigenous people, or even just to remind people in our state that Native people are still here. We're modern. We're not black and white photos. We're here. We're alive. We survived. <laughs> that, um, you know, that teaching needs to um, happen in that K through 12 classroom. The way our education component came about was that in the 90s, well, our tribe still retains the right to hunt, um, fish, or s actually spear fish, and gather man manumen or wild rice in the ceded territory. And that created a lot of controversy in the 1990s. And to, to the fact where there were protests and people were wielding guns and you would see posters in the bars and uh, people protesting where people were uh, spearing the fish, the walleye, the, and the posters would say things like, save a walleye, spear a pregnant squaw. And that was, it, it made the national news a couple times, but it really wasn't as big as you would have thought that it, 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 I, that it warranted. And even, even as uh, late as last year, there was a tribal member who was, spearing with a couple of friends and he was they were shot at so that created a lot of tension between the anglers and the Ojibwe people who still retain that the right to to gather fish to spear fish in the traditional way but bringing that I'm going to kind of in a little bit shift gears here because talk about education and the University of Louisville uh, when President Ramsey uh, had himself got got himself in trouble a couple years back 
and and he was wearing, I don't know if anybody remembers in the audience or, or any students probably weren't here at that time. It's been quite a, a uh, several years ago or if um, the others in, in the on the panel might remember he, he wore and his guests wore big sombreros and then the woman wore, wore something else that was belittling to um, indigenous cultures. And at that same time when he was having that party, there were about five Native American students from University of Louisville and myself who were giving a presentation on how people should not dress as Native Americans for Halloween. But there, we really, there were only maybe two, maybe three guests at that time. So that, that was disheartening to have a group willing to talk and share about what that does to them and then not have anyone come and listen really. So um, if, if, no, if no one else has anything on the education component, which we can certainly come back to it if anybody wants to, the next question that we are to go to is talk about your heritage or what you want people to know about your tribe or nation. And um, Max, we'll start with you this time. If it's okay. Yeah, um, I think the, the biggest thing is just awareness of us, just knowing we're, we're around. Um, you know, people never talk about Wichita's, and then let's talk about Wichita, Kansas. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing. And for me, we have a lot of traditions, a lot of unique traditions actually, um, there on the Southern Plains that, that people don't know about. Um, and it would be, it's really, it's really important that I think people learn about the people um, whose land it was that they live on, right? Um, and the Wichita's and Caddo's, you know, lived all throughout Oklahoma, Kansas, um, you know, northeastern Texas, that that entire region, and people don't even really acknowledge that. Um, so I think I think that's the big thing that I want people to know about us, uh, which is a sad thing to have to say, honestly. Um, but yeah, I think I've only met one person who, like, when I said, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm Wichita," they understood what I meant. You know, I just right off the bat. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I, you know, a lot of other tribes have more visibility, um, but but we we unfortunately do not have that. One thing I was going to add earlier when we were talking too is that indigenous or Native American culture and history is not just Native American history, but it's it's the history of the United States. It's the, it's the history of the North American continent, and even states that do not have any political or tribal groups that are recognized either federally or state, they still are a group, there, there's still land where tribal people once lived. There is no state that, that, that doesn't have that history. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it shapes how things work nowadays, too. I mean, it's like we said, you know, the the place names, the roads. I mean, so many things are influenced by those people and they're, it's not even acknowledged. And, you know, in particular, you know, going back to this idea of it, it's really a hard image for America to look at. We're looking in the mirror and it's not pretty, like uh, Dr. Sheffield said. And for, in particular for the state of Georgia, you know, where I'm from and where most of my experience is, it's a really bad, bad past um, with the Trail of Tears. And even recently with, you know, with the Atlanta Braves and, you know, some of the controversy with that, um, there are no federally recognized tribes in the state of Georgia. Um, and, you know, there's a reason for that. And it's because of the checkered history that has existed in the state of Georgia. So it's a hard thing because people don't want to acknowledge it because they have to admit these bad things happened. Um, and, that, and that's a thing that people don't want to look in the mirror at the end of the day. Dr. Sheffield, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Celine. Maxwell said, and by the way, for the folks in the room, please go eat. There's a lot of food mm -hmm. down there and I'm staring at it and I'm hungry. So please go eat on my behalf. So please go to find some food. Um, the, the thing I, I got a big kick out of was, uh, Max, you helped me remember something that I always feel. And my, my wife, um, we've been married now for 33 years. 
It's hard to believe because I'm 29. Joking. <laughs> so uh, the thing that I always get a big kick out of is um, I will drive by somebody and I'll see always. It, it, it now it's not always, but I'm being dramatic. A um, um, a dream catcher hanging somewhere in somebody's car or truck. And I get the, I don't know, there's just something in me. It's not bad, it's a positive feeling, but it's an interesting feeling. Because what I found in my my history is that some of the folks who have had the hardest time with culture, all cultures, will have some sort of indigenous stamp somewhere. For example, an audience, you'll love this, you may be one of these folks and that's cool. Everyone has a great, great, great grandma who was a Cherokee princess, every single one of them. And that's not a bad thing. It's actually kind of, if you think about it from an indigenous point of view, it's actually kind of cool because name one other culture that that is a constant conversation piece in. You can't, you won't. But what you will hear is on, at least in North America, you'll hear people really search for an indigenous connection. They'll search for it and with pride. So I think that's kind of a cool, um, a cool piece of it. I, I think to answer your question, Celine, the thing I'd like for uh, people to know about my tribe is that the Quetzal people um, were very close to the Mojave, Mojave people as well. So I'm, I'm, and there's like a couple of Mojave in the background for for myself for my DNA. Um, we are part of the Kumeyaay. The Kumeyaay are um, a tribe of people who, who are in Southern California and have DNA, um, DNA dig. We've literally been DNA and stamped 12 to 15,000 years on that same plot of land. This is a very important part. And I always say this, and it shocks people when we go down there, because people don't think that tribes have been here that long. What they want to believe is what they were told early on, which is, well, they were only here for a couple of days. And, you know, we just borrowed the rivers and stuff. We just, you know, we built some boats. and But no. Tribes have been here for at least 12 to 15, if not more, thousands of years. And that's the thing I want to really always leave with the audience is that when we talk about um, indigeneity, what we mean is every breath you take today, every step you make, I sound like the Sting song, right? Uh, every single thing you do literally is from our ancestors today. Literally everything, every single thing you do, and, and I do, it's from thousands of years of indigenous people being here. So um, we're just trying to craft a better way to say that today in a way that it's consumed and brought in by people in a much more, um, in a quicker way to make, to make more positive change. And I'm not sure, America's not the only country that does this, but when we try to craft, or maybe not even try, but when we're crafting these stories and myths and things that make a country great there are a lot of things that get changed along the way one of my research areas is the lewis and clark expedition because I, I do research on sagagawea or sacagawea as some people have have uh, interpreted the name but before i read all of the diaries of lewis and clark i didn't realize that every day every other day they are encountering a different group of native americans and it's it, it if you don't read the history about it you think mm, lewis and clark yeah they went out they they did all this exploring and um it wasn't a great feat and yay america but they did absolutely nothing that native people weren't already doing as a matter of fact they, if it wasn't for the native people, they wouldn't have been able to do what they did. And they had guides with them, not just Sagagawea, who, who, who gets named as the guide, but she was mostly with them um, as, as an interpreter. And she did guide them a little bit, but mostly as an interpreter. And then she carried a child with them. And when I perform as her, mostly in the plains, but people are, people will say things like, oh my gosh, she had a little baby and she was traveling outside and in a canoe and, and traveling on horseback. And I'm thinking, yeah, and so were thousands and thousands of other Native women across the country. And then they start thinking about how we put, and there, there are more statues of Sagagawea in the United States than any other woman. So we put her on a pedestal and then we forget all the other Native women who were before her 
and lived during her time and have lived after her time. And they have been doing the same exact thing. So um, it is interesting how we construct the, the social constructions we make, the myths we make, the stories we make, and then we tell them and we tell them wrong over and over again. Michelle, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that topic before we switch gears? I, I actually wanted to go back to something that Ron mentioned about, um, you know, I, I think some of the, the innovation and technology and just knowledge about the environment and being able to live on the land that comes from I indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge. I think it's been interesting um, recently just with, uh, with climate change conversations and with uh, seemingly a heightened awareness about, um, you, know, you know, about the environment and, and animals and plants and, you know, renewed energy to kind of appreciate um, sustainable living. And, um, you know, all of a sudden the spotlight is on Native people in terms of that very awareness that Ron is talking about that, you know, oh, these people who have been able to live off the land, um, especially in really harsh environments, um, Phoenix, um, you know, in, in Yuma <laughs> being good examples of that, where it's very hot in the summertime, water can be very limited. Um, and yet we have this sophisticated canal system here in our area that was engineered successfully by indigenous ancestors. And I think it's it's great that there's this renewed interest and awareness of all of that um, traditional ecological knowledge. TEK is really huge right now. There's a lot of interest courses being taught and books being written and that's a good thing, but I think it's, um, you know, it kind of gives us a chance to have a little bit of that spotlight in terms of, again, reminding people that, yeah, there's really something to that traditional ecological knowledge and that, um, you know, there really was some sophistication and some smarts about the way Indigenous people lived on the land and, and you know, took care of plants and animals and, and things of that sort. But I think it's it would be good to... Um, use that renewed energy and kind of this momentum we have now to definitely bring communities along with us in terms of where do we go from here? You know, what are the next steps? How do we keep this conversation going? Um, here, there's a lot of interesting community gardens, which I think are a great way to kind of bring together. And, you know, the benefits can be for everybody, but for our tribal communities, it's a great way to remind our own, especially younger generations, people who maybe forgot that, you know, their grandparents, um, ancestors lived off of some of these. In, in our landscape, it might be living off of, um, you know, fruits that come from cactus, from these desert plants that look like they can't, you know, they're so dry and look, they look dead half the time in the summertime. And you wonder, well, how are people harvesting food that sustains them off of these cactus and these desert plants? But, you know, when you know the rhythms of the environment and, you know, and of the seasons, you know that that's entirely possible to, to farm and to live off um, the land. So it's just, I think it, it reminds us of the pride in terms of that indigenous knowledge, but for, for communities that have really struggled with language loss and even maybe forgetting some of our traditions or some of those traditional farming practices, it's a great way to kind of educationally to remind us um, of that, of that know-how that came from our communities. Um, I, I don't want to hog the, <laughs> the, the microphone for too long, but if I could go back to the question about um, what I'd like people to know about um, the, about my nation or community, um, I think with regard to the Navajo Nation um, during COVID, there was a lot of interest in Navajo Nation because people saw, you know, CNN in, um, in the Washington Post, New York Times did stories on COVID's impact on the Navajo Nation. And, and people all of a sudden realized that there were families 
there are families out on the Navajo reservation without running water, um, without electricity, and you know, all of a sudden, uh, COVID shines the light on the fact that there were a lot of people who had these infrastructure challenges, but also once everybody had to go online for for learning or to um, you know, be able to, to do telemedicine, we also realize that we have a huge disparity in terms of um, connectivity. So, um, you know, I, I think all of that media coverage on the Navajo Nation in the last two years um, has been interesting. It's been helpful so far as, you know, there have been a lot of um, crowdfunding efforts to try to um, pay for for some community-based projects to, for example, provide water for some of these really rural communities. But I think, um, you know, what, what I hope people know about Navajo or what happens now after COVID is that there continues to be interest in terms of learning about um, not just the pandemic in Navajo Nation, but kind of that broader understanding of history and culture, and even some of the modern um, successes and challenges that we have on the Navajo Nation. Um, and the fact that even within our community, there's tremendous diversity across Navajo. So one Navajo person is not like the other, you know, that we're, we're such a huge community um, people often compare the size of our territory to the state of West Virginia. And within Navajo, there are 110 different dis just distinct locally governed communities. So one size doesn't fit all in terms of how we problem solve in our communities. And so it's complex in terms of how we govern and even with dialect differences across the nation in terms of the Navajo language, um, when it comes to culture, we don't even agree sometimes on on coyote stories. You know, there are different versions of it, kind of depending on what part of the reservation you come from. Um, in in terms of Navajo humor, you know, we make fun of we make fun of ourselves and we make fun of other people from other parts of the reservation. So it's, um, you know, you can't kind of lump us all together as a Navajo community and kind of assume that one Navajo is just like the other. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity within our community. Celine, can I Michelle? make a quick comment real quick? I, I just wanted to say young people in the audience or anybody watching this in the future, if you just listen to Dr. Hale, that's the reason why we're a matriarchy and that's the reason why we're still here. What you just heard Dr. Hale do is exactly the reason why there are still Native people here having this conversation. So well done. And I'm Coyote Clan, by the way. I've heard all of those jokes and we, we do the same exact thing. So sorry. Go ahead, Celine. I was just going to add that there's a huge cultural divide, right, between uh, working with the earth and creating the earth as it's a living thing, which wasn't uh, really something that Americans talked about prior to much of the 70s and then thinking I'm going to use the earth and resources for my benefit and if you read the diaries in the Lewis and Clark that from the Lewis and Clark expedition they're constantly noting where the resources are and how they're going to get them and that's pretty much their their concern they're not too worried about uh, maybe a little bit worried about getting along with the native people but they're mostly worried about having them succumb or um, be a subject to to what they their their rule and what they want so let's move on to the next question which is how would you define diversity and inclusion and I'll, it's a two-part question so i'll ask the second part how would you see indigenous identities fitting into the public conversation of diversity and inclusion and then someone wrote if at all Dr. Sheffield, I'm going to start with you today for, for this for this one. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, how would I define diversity inclusion? Um, so to me, I can only answer that part of it by answering the back end of it first. So pardon me, Celine, I'm going to go forward just a tad. The, the kind of the mantra that I've taken over the last, um, I'd say, 15 or so years of my life has been 
all diversity and inclusion conversations on this dirt begin with the indigenous conversation, all of them. And that's not always popular. That always that sometimes I'm, I can I've watched people in the audience do this with me when I make that comment. And again, I'm OK with that. I'm OK with their discomfort because the goal is not to be um, is not to be adversarial. The goal is to understand that that all conversations, at least on the dirt we walk on every day, it must begin with the indigenous perspective in mind, because uh, everyone else, which goes back to the blood quantum thing that I won't go back on again, um, everyone else is a kind of sort of maybe invited person. So, and that includes half of my DNA. So it's not a disrespect, it's just a respect that we begin diversity inclusion with an indigenous perspective. And I've done that, tried to do that in a respectful way. And and Celine, I think you did this wonderfully. I, I'm trying to make that conversation a conversation that we can all have instead of an adversarial one, because there's there's a lot of DNI conversations that are adversarial today, and I don't think they're productive. I do believe that the ones that are most productive are the ones that say, "Listen, let's have a conversation about it, a real talk about it. What what thing confuses you about that culture?" And maybe I can answer it. Maybe I can't. Maybe I'm the wrong person. Diversity in our culture is as wide as any other culture, right? Thank you, Michelle. Um, I think that we can have that conversation around DNI, but only. Only if there's someone somewhere in that conversation that's an indigenous person who says, hey, that's cool. You had the conversation. Now, let me remind all of you of where you're standing and what's going on and who was here. So and I, I try to do that with some humor and I often try to do it in a way that people aren't put off by the conversation, but I definitely do it. And so, Selene, I think that was a brilliant question. And I hope that answered it because there's in my mind, I don't have a clear definition of diversity inclusion. I don't. I, I just go back to the place that says, you know, I'm I'm half of two incredibly cool cultures. I just happen to affiliate uh, with my mom, who is full blood, and my, my, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when your mom's native, you're native, at least in my tribe. I like the fact that I think this happens and the uncomfortable happens for, for several reasons. Number one, if people aren't thinking, what are we doing? Number two, I don't think change happens unless we're uncomfortable. If we're all comfy and cozy, there's no reason to get up off the couch. And if everything is copacetic, why do we even have educational institutions? So I think my the church that I'm attending is very proud to be open and affirming. But we look at it as that's just tiny step number one. We're, we're just barely scratching the surface. And there are so many things that we have yet to do that we, we want, we ask and we wanna learn and we have a long way to go. I think the Christian church has a long way to go. So I like the fact, and, and I, I found out for myself too, when I'm uncomfortable, that's when I learn, that's when I change. And if I'm not changing and growing, why am I here? So that, that's just my little personal two cents there. So uh, Dr. Hale, did you have something you wanted to add on diversity and inclusion and indigenous identities with, with accompanying that? Sure, um, I think what I, and, and I'm really kind of speaking to what's happening here in Arizona, um, but I, I think, you know, around land acknowledgement statements, it's been interesting that um, more organizations and governments and community groups, um, you know, it, it seemed like they became very popular uh, about a year and a half ago. And I, because we were all locked down with COVID and everybody was on Zoom. I mean, it even was the point to, it was to the point where people would be on Zoom and would give the land acknowledgement statement for, you know, whatever, California or Minnesota, or wherever, wherever they were. And I think what I've noticed here in terms of the indigenous community um, after a year plus of land acknowledgements is people are now saying, okay, well, what do we do with it? You know, that's 
really nice that everybody's doing land acknowledgement, but what happens now in terms of action? You know, where does the rubber hit the road now then in terms of let's not just have this be a warm, fuzzy acknowledgement where, you know, and that's a step in the right direction in terms of education and hopefully some positive community relationships. But I think, um, especially here on our campus, people want to push a little more on that in terms of saying, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of active engagement? Um, you know, what are we doing to work together? What are we doing to maybe have discussions in some of these uncomfortable spaces? What are we doing to include communities? You know, not just an intellectual academic community, but what are we doing to provide access to our home communities back on the reservation or even an urban Indian community so that, you know, the university isn't kind of an ivory tower exclusive community where we're talking land acknowledgement, we're trying to honor indigenous knowledge, but let's not forget our families. Let's not forget, you know, people back home and let's make sure that this is an open and welcoming space for all of them as well. So I think, um, you know, I'm old enough that I remember when diversity was kind of a big thing back in the 90s when I was in graduate school. And my hope is that it isn't just sort of a trendy thing that everyone's kind of talking about right now and then things kind of go back to normal. And um, again, we have to fight a little harder just to have some awareness around indigenous issues, hopefully. Um, you know, now that everybody's kind of talking about diversity and inclusion, there's some real tangibles in terms of um, things that people are doing together, talking about, or um, even partnering on in terms of, you know, let, let's have some action around this diversity and, and inclusion and not just have it be um, kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling. Max? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said so far. Um, you know, people want to want to have that first step and then they want to stay there because it's uncomfortable to keep going. Right. And that's that's when you have to keep going is when it starts to become uncomfortable. Um, and for me and like my experience here at the University of Georgia is we're finally starting to, to turn that corner. I think, you know, prior to this past year, there was no student-led organization for Native students here on this campus. The Institute of Native American Studies here was like very disorganized. They didn't have their own office or building. Um, it, it was really kind of a bad thing, especially since this is a state that has a such checkered past, like I said before. And in particular, Athens, you know, the town that our college is in has a very checkered past um, with Native people. And finally, this past year, you know, we started our organization and, you know, the Institute of Native American Studies, they finally got their own office. Um, they have full time staff now that are working on these initiatives. We've started to work with admissions on speaking to Native students who've been admitted here, which has never been a thing in the past at this university. And we're now we're discussing what is the next step beyond that, right? How do we get more Native peoples to this campus? How do we get more students here in Georgia? To start to really to really bring them into that conversation and um, our organization we joined uh, multicultural services and programs which is under the department of student affairs uh, here at uga and we are the first organization that's joined that since 2006 um, so it's, it's really kind of a big deal for the university of georgia to acknowledge us and make us a part of their institution um, and i you know i had a big meeting with them earlier today about you know, what our plans are moving forward for this next school year. And, you know, we're talking about these very same things. Like, how do we increase the visibility of Native community here, not even just the students, but also staff and faculty? And how do we um, include them in these conversations and make sure that the university is aware of them and that their needs are being met? And, you know, that's a huge focus that I think is finally starting to happen here. Um, and I'm really glad to be a part of that change. Well, I used to serve. I'll just add real quick what what my experience has been since I was at 
University of Louisville. I used to serve on the Committee of Diversity and Racial Equality at U of L, and my term just finished up last year. Kentucky's mandated to, well, the University of Louisville is mandated by the state to be more inclusive with African Americans, but there's nothing for Asians, Native Americans. And so when I used, when I would bring that up in CODRA, the Committee on Diversity and Racial Equality, a lot of times I would get what Dr. Sheffield's talking about, the eyes rolling and the, the feeling of, well, we don't have to. And that was from people who were mostly minorities. And that would be um, a little disheartening. I think things are changing a little bit. Um, let's move on to another question. How, if at all, has the sediment toward Native people shifted throughout your lifetime? What have you observed? Dr. Hale? I, that's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, um, because I, I think working in an educational environment, I know that um, because I, I teach a lot of undergraduate classes, and so I'm always working with young people um, just out of high school and um, by and large, and, and I think what's not changed um, are some of those questions about um, about how tribal governments work or tribal sovereignty or just uh, I think trying to understand some of the reality behind the um, stereotypes um, that that are still popular still pervasive out there and so you know as an educator I think what's been constant um, over all the years has been really addressing some of those um, in, you know, there are things like assuming that um, all indigenous people get health care and education scholarships, everything's paid for by the federal government. Or people think that, um, you know, we're all casino Indians. And if we have casinos, then everybody's just kind of rolling in cash. And, um, you know, so there, there's a lot of that negativity around um, dependency. Um, or that, you know, the, the notion of the drunken Indian, you know, is, is still popular out there. Um, and so I, I think particularly in my intro to AIS class, uh, a lot of the work that we do is, um, is grappling with all that. And I think because I'm at a university where we have a lot of indigenous students, um, that intro to AIS class is always very interesting because it's kind of two groups of people where you have indigenous students who are there and you know a lot of it is searching to learn more about their own identity, their own history, their own culture, or to celebrate what they know about language, about tradition, um, and some of that is searching for validation for that because it's sometimes not always appreciated, especially if they grew up in urban areas. Um, so there's kind of that aspect of it. And then the other part of it is, um, is non-Indigenous students. And that's where I think all of that unpacking of stereotypes in terms of saying, okay, well, if you think Indians are, are are drunks, <laughs> then let's let's look at that. I mean, certainly many of our communities really do grapple with alcohol and substance abuse. And, you know, let's look at, at, at that reality in terms of the nature of the challenge and what we're doing to work on that. But let's also talk about some of the other things happening in indigenous communities where maybe that's not so much the case. Let's look at some of the positives because a lot of those stereotypes are very negative. And I think when, and I see this particularly with our young students is they're confronted with that, you know, when you're in, an urban space or you're on social media where people can kind of post anything uh, about you, a racist remark or um, continue to kind of perpetuate some of these um, stereotypes and misunderstandings about indigenous people and our culture. And so a lot of it is, um, is education. And I've even had students kind of complain saying, well, all that I do is educate non-Indians about <laughs> 
you know, my, my tribe or my culture, I'm, I'm tired of it. But I, I think the reality is, you know, in a lot of spaces that we operate in, um, because that misunderstanding is still so pervasive that education continues to be an important part of it. And it does require a lot of patience. Um, and sometimes people just don't want to deal anymore with some of the stereotypes or misunderstandings. It's not for everybody, but, you know, I've had um, friends and family who have served in state government, and they will say that 90% of my job is education because people don't understand tribal governments. People wonder why we're so wound up about tribal sovereignty. Um, and so it's kind of those basics of where these notions come from and why they're so important to, to tribal communities. Thank you. Dr. Sheffield. I love the term wound up, Shell. That was fantastic. That was perfect. I've used that one a hundred times. That was very, very, that's, I feel this anyway. Uh, the first one is that I wanted to, if I could, Michelle, I think the, uh, one of the things, there's so many young people out there. I want to just make a, a point. This thing, this, this, this thing is the purest form of weakness that we, you're going to go through on any given day. And I asked that, I said it on purpose. When you can type something with no connection to your humanity and hurt another person, it is the purest form of weakness that we can possibly conjure. And I've used that many times talking to, uh, when I've taught some undergrad courses as well, Michelle, because it's just, it's not what indigenous people do. Authenticity is what we do, right? It truly is who we are. That's how we're still here. So I'll tell a quick story to answer the question about how I feel indigenous people have been, have been looked at differently over my lifetime. I gave a lecture um, titled uh, Learning a New Way to Fight uh, to about 450 indigenous uh, young people in Phoenix, actually, uh, Michelle, uh, about four years ago. And um, the, the question I asked and put up on the screen was, uh, I put a picture of the Washington Redskins logo and the name Washington Redskins. And I asked the question, how many of you are upset by what you see? Now this is 450 plus, you know, indigenous students, and you could, you know, we we were we were we were making noise at this point, right? So because it's a sensitive thing, and it and it hurts, it hurts a lot of people. And I said, okay, would it bother you if I say to you, I really don't want you to pay any attention to this right now? A whole now, exactly. I'm watching Celine's face. She's like, eh, well, you might want to pay attention, but from a big picture, from the big picture. I said, don't pay any attention to this, just just for a little while. Keep keep it in keep it in your um, briefcase, keep it in your backpack, keep it balled up there for a while. But don't. This is not what we need to be paying attention to right now. What we should be paying attention to right now are the many men and women on the reservations who are beaten and raped and harmed every day. That's where we pay attention first, and then we'll go attack this Washington Redskins name. And there, of course, could be some argument that, well, if you do this first, nah, it's, it's, too, it's too easy. I said, now, I want you, at this point, you can imagine 450 students are pretty wound up. And I'm, I'm literally seeing people moving around and touching their hair. You can see all of this, the telltale signs of emotional reaction, which I thought was beautiful. And I said, now, here's the biggest takeaway that I want you to know. If you are aggravated by this conversation and if you're aggravated by the Washington Redskins, I want you to go read as many books as you can. I want you to start a company that just simply kicks butt, and I want you to buy the Washington Redskins and change the name yourself. The reason why I did that is because that's how I feel indigenous people in my 53 years has changed, at least from my mom and talking to my tribal elders, how it's changed. is that the idea of some empowerment has slowly kind of oozed its way back in to our lives to a small, very small degree. But enough of that has oozed in that, Celine, guess what? There's four of us on the phone right now. There's four of us. On, so I go back to that on purpose because I'm so proud of it. Um, and, and there truly is a connected power that I don't think we could have had not too many years ago during my lifetime. So that's my take on how indigenous people have been treated a little differently between possibly my lifetime. My mother and my uncle still do not have cell phones. <laughs> it's, and it's not that they can't afford them. They just do not want them. Max? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot is a lot has already been said that I agree with. Um, you know, talking about where we should fight, it absolutely begins with the real problems. Not to say that you know these representation issues are not issues, right? But they're you know, it's so much more important to stop physical violence and physical problems. You know, the lack of access to to water and electricity and poverty and you know all these other things are so much more important and they get overlooked and the reason why is because it's hard it's hard work you know anybody can can say that you know this symbol is bad anyone can say a logo or a name is bad and of course it is but it's so much harder to actually affect structural change and i think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about people staying in their comfort zone you know you know, it's so much harder to say, wow, there are people in my state, even if you're in Arizona, right, that do not have running water and electricity. It's harder to admit that and to know that's a problem than to say, you know, a football team has this logo and that's bad. So I, that's my thoughts on that. I absolutely agree. Um, I also think that, you know, for myself, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to live in a time period where there hasn't been too much animosity, I think overall, especially compared to like other other times in American history with natives. It's kind of hard because in the state of Georgia, like I said, there are not very many of us. So a lot of times it's it's kind of hard because I'm just we're just overlooked in general. So you know it's kind of hard to tell if there is that animosity sometimes. Um and in going back to what I said to the previous question, you know, things are starting to change and I can feel it, you know, especially on this campus. It's really beginning to change. And that's something that I'm really thankful for. And, you know, just having that increased visibility and having, you know, the our voices being heard, right? Like I said, our, our organization didn't even exist um, beyond this fall. You know, we, we just started this past fall. And before that, I was, you know, I was just any other college student. And now we have this organization and we, you know, are able to really affect this change. And I, I'm glad to be a part of it, like I said previously. Um, I think that's the biggest change I've really seen in my lifetime, actually. Because um, otherwise, you know, Georgia's Georgia at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Max. I, I'll be real quick with mine. The, mm -hmm. Maybe in some ways the biggest change is hardly anyone ever asks me anymore if I or any of my family members live in a teepee which I think I very much appreciate. Healthcare, it's, it's like Sesame Street. Sesame Street was created to try to help African-American children improve their education, but what happened is everybody improved. So healthcare has improved for Native Americans, but it's still, the disparities are still, are still pretty, pretty big. They're still there. Um, the next question. Um, I hate to interrupt you here. I have a student who um, needs to leave soon and wanted to ask a question before the Q&A, if that's all right. That'd be fine. <laughs> they wanted to ask, could you tell us about your culture, traditions, and something symbolic in your tribe? We'll start with Max. Go ahead. Yeah, um, so I guess, I guess I'll mostly speak about the Wichita's because that's where I'm enrolled. Um, so, like I said earlier, we're from the Southern Plains, uh, particularly the um, Oklahoma, North Texas area. Um, and we, we try to think of um, the great symbolism, I think it's actually on our tribal seal, is they lived um, in these grass houses, the uh, Wichita grass houses. Um, and uh, I think that's the, the biggest symbol. It kind of looks like a giant beehive almost. Um, and it's really interesting because people will never think of that. Because um, everybody obviously just assumes it would be, you know, living in a teepee and all of that, um, which they did during the summer when um, they went to, to hunt buffalo. But, you know, the, the Wichita house is a, is a really fascinating symbol, I think, that, that we use. Dr. Sheffield? Uh, thank you. Um, by the way, the student, that was a massive question. Massive, massive question. So I'll narrow it down the, the best I can. Um, 
uh, the Quetzan have been on our land on the Colorado for a very long time. So the water of the Colorado tend to be um, the most culturally relevant um, portion of our tribe. I'd say ceremonial, the one that comes to mind is that we're one of a very small handful. I think the number was six, the last I, I was able to look up, who we, we actually still conduct our traditional um, burial ceremony, which used to be seven days and seven nights, and now it's been narrowed down to three days and three nights, um, where we um, send our tribal members to uh, the next place. And that's a very, it, we literally go through what you might see on television, right? We literally, that really is our ceremony, and it's very closed off uh, to non-tribal members. So that's, um, that's very cool, I think. It's always a good thing to kind of go through. But um, yeah, I think that that probably touched on it enough. Dr. Hale, thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll talk about the, the Navajo Nation um, in, I think in terms of a, a strong cultural symbol, what comes to mind is the Hogan, uh, which is the traditional dwelling, um, which if you ever, any of you ever um, maybe as a tourist visit Monument Valley or you drive across the Navajo Nation, you'll probably see the, um, the eight-sided um, Hogan. There's actually a lot of, uh, almost everything in Navajo culture is gendered either male or female. And so we have male and female Hogans. Um, but the, the eight-sided Hogan, I think is symbolic of the Navajo philosophy in terms of life, our approach to life. The, um, and there's a lot of directionality, significance um, attached to the four cardinal directions. And so something that, again, if you travel, happen to travel across Navajo, you'll see that um, most of the entrances, so the front door to people's homes faces the east, because that's an important direction in terms of where your journey starts. It's where your journey starts in life. It's where your journey starts as you greet the day. And so your Hogan or your home or your mobile trailer, mobile home trailer door, you know, whatever your house is, the door should be facing east. And when you enter a Hogan, um, you know, usually there's a fireplace in the middle. And traditionally, the, the proper way to enter a Hogan is to go left. So you're going from east to south to west to north. And what's symbolic about that directionality is each of those quadrants kind of represent um, a phase of your life. So when you're an infant, you know, that's symbolized by the East. Um, you know, again, it's a new day, it's a new beginning. It's your chance to kind of think about what you're going to do, what your life is going to be. On the South side of it, that's where you're, you're planning. You're a young person. You're planning your goals, maybe planning your education. Um, but as you move through that, you go west, you go north, you know, that comes with your maturity that represents your journey in life um, from young person to a mature adult person to middle age person. And the north side represents old age, um, the wisdom that comes with being an elderly person and your chance to kind of reflect on what you planned, what you implemented, you know, in your old age is your is your chance to kind of think about that. So, it's a very strong symbol um, in Navajo philosophy. And as as a university professor, I think it's interesting how people, Navajo people, are applying that philosophy to um, things like design for the built environment. I just was on a dissertation um, defense committee the other day where a student um, applied that Navajo philosophy to um, developing a tool for rating construction projects. You know, it's applying that Navajo philosophy to the way we design and build um, you know, buildings on the reservation. So it's so powerful a uh, philosophy in terms of um, Navajo thinking and doing that, um, you know, people do some, some really creative and powerful things in terms of integrating that Navajo philosophy to the things that we do, um, you know, 
to, to help our community from healthcare to construction and design to education that Navajo philosophy is um, really powerful in that regard. So again, whenever you all visit Navajo Nation, um, be sure and as you're driving by, look out the window to see which way the front doors of the homes are facing. I'm smiling extra big because I'm thinking of the time I went to a friend's wedding and they the, the woman's family built the, um, the Hogan and we did exactly like Dr. Hale says, you go in and you circle to the left. And I was seated next to this man who kept looking at his watch. He kept, and I thought, how very unindigenous. And I, I thought to myself, who is this guy? Who is this guy who just keeps looking at his watch? Turns out it was the tribal president. <laughs> so, but uh, it was beautiful, beautiful wedding, beautiful ceremony. We live in a few things about Ojibwe culture. Uh, don't live in a teepee or did not traditionally live in a teepee nor a hogan, but something maybe closer to a hogan, which would be a wakaigan. And they, they could be circular or they could be more oval shaped. Um, the Ojibwe are the largest group of Native Americans in the North American continent. They are in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, and the reason they're the largest in the North American continent is because a lot of them are in Canada. Um, Lac du Flambeau people are known for their beautiful beadwork, and it's Lac du Flambeau is French for Lake of the Torches, and so the, the torches would be built or made, and then they would use those to spear the walleye in the evenings. Uh, we also had one of the very first fish, fish hatcheries in the state of Wisconsin. So, do we have another question from the audience? If not, oh, go, go ahead. I, I can say I can open it up to questions, but you're welcome to go back to finishing some of the panel questions if you want to do that. If we didn't have any questions from the audience, I think we just have a couple more left from from the list of things. Um, so how has, and, and I think Dr. Hale talked about this, but maybe the gentlemen haven't, how have has Native identity influenced your career or your field, the work that you do? Dr. Sheffield, do you want to start? Happy to, happy to. Um, the bulk of my career uh, has been uh, in technology. I started my entire, um, I guess, learning new skills. I bought a, a DB4 book, it was about this thick, and I built a database on my Tandy computer. No one in the audience probably knows. Well, okay, maybe Michelle knows, but Tandy was Radio Shack, right? This is um, this back. This is back when Fire wasn't quite created yet. It just had come out, and um, I built, I wrote the code to make a, um, a database. So I started because it interests me. And as I grew in my profession, I was, I only stayed a developer a very short amount of time because I got bored very fast. I'm like, I, I don't mind doing it, but Celine, I'm not going to do what you ask me to do. You know, I'm not, I, cause it's just in me. I'm just not going to do it. So, but if I want to do it, I'll do it. Uh, anyhow. Um, so I, I go along in my career. And um, what I found was that my perspectives on the world and young people, existentialism was not created by anybody you know. Indigenous people created existentialism. And the whole idea of that topic is to recognize that you're greater than you are. You're, you're truly something different, right? And our spirit worlds begin to discuss, we got totally different conversation, but that's how I began to really understand that my mom and my family had really from a from pre an embryo state had been telling me these things and it just it bubbled up into me and I was about 30 something before I realized the reason why I love this technology space is because I understand it and it's not because I you know was super smart about any particular topic of it it's just that at an ethereal perspective it makes sense to me it, it makes sense that all things are are truly connected and that has as I'm now 53 year old man, I rec recognize that my life's work has almost entirely been driven by the ideas that my mom and my family put in me as a tiny, tiny little human. And that the DNA allowed me to understand that everything is connected, everything. And if you, if you do any technology work at all, you recognize very fast 
that everything truly is connected in that space. So that's that's how it's influenced my career. Thank you, Max. Yeah, I'm not really into my career yet, to be honest. Um, but similar kind of to what Dr. Sheffield just said, that that idea of complete interconnectedness is something that I really see in the business world. You know, I'm an international business and marketing student. And, you know, it's just fascinating to see how things are really interconnected um, kind of organically almost, you know, between in things like international trade and, and policy and all these things that we talk about in the classes that I'm in. Um, and it's really looking through it. I look through it at least through that, through that same lens that, that Dr. Sheffield was really talking about. Um, and it, you know, like, like he was saying, it's through, you know, the teachings that, I, that I've received mostly from my mother as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's really what I've seen as well. Um, and I think, you know, in general, of course, you know, at any time, you know, the culture and the, the way that you were raised influences really everything um, about how you handle your, your career or your studies or anything like that and how you, how you present yourself. And it's really just kind of uh, interwoven into all the things um, that you do, honestly. Dr. Hale, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I know you touched upon this a little earlier. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm really lucky, um, I have to say, in terms of, uh, I think, just geographically being where we're located in Arizona and uh, being able to work with um, dozens upon dozens of Indigenous students who um, take our American Indian Studies classes. Um, you know, you don't see American Indian Studies as freestanding departments across a lot of universities in the United States. And, you know, um, at one point we had nine Indigenous um, faculty, nine Native people with PhDs, which is a pretty big deal. And, um, you know, nine people who are enrolled citizens of Indigenous nations. And so there's really positive representation um, here that I think we're very fortunate to have. And, um, you know, the there's a lot of importance and power, I think, in being able to um, teach classes and to work with students because that representation is still very important. It matters that students can see themselves in the faculty and in the staff. Um, who, who work across campus. And, you know, I've had students um, from my own community at Navajo who have taken my classes and who have said, you know, you're the first, um, you're the first Navajo with a PhD I've ever met. And it, it's still, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of getting our own people um, you know, in this space where people have PhDs or other professional degrees and can do this kind of work and write the books and, um, you know, do get research grants and teach classes. And, you know, it's important to the college students um, that we work with that they see people from their home communities um, being successful in that space. And I think being a, a Navajo person, being Diné, um, you know, and because we have a lot of Navajo students at our school, um, and one thing I think is, is really amazing that hasn't changed over all the years that I've been teaching is that a lot of our Indigenous students are very committed to getting their education and doing something to give back to the community. They want to help their people. They want to do something positive. And so I feel really fortunate um, in my role here to kind of be a conduit to that, to help them connect classroom learning, to be able to do the things that they want to do to improve, um, you know, quality of life or just to make things better for, for families back home. And I think just, you know, in terms of the link to, to identity, because I grew up on the reservation, I, I know what the challenges are academically to come from a reservation school and then to try to be successful in a mainstream institution. I know that's not easy. 
And so, um, you know, I can really identify with a lot of the challenges that our students struggle with. Um, but it's it's such an honor to be able to be that cheerleader here on campus to support them. And, um, you know, over the years, we've seen them graduate and go, go on to become lawyers and tribal council members and scientists and to just do all these amazing things, which I think is absolutely fantastic. I'll add just a little bit about my experience with my career. I was a journalist for about 10 years before I went back to graduated from Purdue and then went back to school and started my master's at Indiana University. So they had that, my journalism experience. But being an, an indigenous journalist allowed me to have empathy for people who did not have the power and who did not have the voice. And so I always wanted to tell their story. Now, I don't think journalism in the United States is at its highest point these days, so I don't think that's being done as well as it could and should be done. But at least at that time, it allowed me to do a really good job. And it also led me to go on and get a master's and a PhD in, in those areas. And um, today, I'm kind of leaving a little bit out, but Today, I probably do more with poetry than anything because I find that my poetry can do things that none of my other studies and research thing are, are capable of doing. I want to be able to convey to people things that they've not thought about and that they don't re even realize and their their power and their influence. And, and hopefully make them think about the things that they that they do in a different way and think about the people who don't have the voice and not just native people, but there are many other subcultures that that, that are in our society who, who don't have the voice and to not look at them and pay attention to their problems and their issues is um, kind of un-American. So I'll leave it at that. What's the biggest? No, and let's let's keep this one real short. We have two more questions. And does it wait for? Does anyone have any questions from the audience? Then the next one is biggest misconception about Native and Indigenous identities. <laughs> that you did somebody have a question? Um, I think so. Can you hear me? Okay, so my question is this. Um, so my background, like I am Hispanic, Latina, Latinx, and so within our community, the conversation of how we identify between Hispanic, Latina, Latino, and Latinx, Latine. So I want to pose the question for you all in terms of how you all identify as either like First Nations, Indigenous, American Indian, Native American, and all of those different derivatives. And so my, my question is kind of your take on all of those different, I guess, identifiers or qualifiers. I'll start this one off because this one has something to do with being a journalist and what I tell my students. All four of us identify with our nation. So the terms Native American, American Indian, Indian, and any other similar term really don't mean a whole heck of a lot to us because that just lumps us all together and those are terms that were given to us. Those aren't the terms that we use for ourselves. So I'm Anishinaabe, I'm a Ojibwe, and I'm from Lac du Flambeau. So I, I'm Anishinaabe in a larger group, Ojibwe in a, in a smaller, and then even tinier than that, specific nation is Lac du Flambeau. But what I tell my students when they're asking, when they're doing an interview is no matter who it is, you need to ask them, how do you want to be identified? And this goes along with uh, GLBTQ and things like that. How do you want to, when I'm writing your name, Tom Jones, Mary Smith, how do I identify you? And, and spell that out for me so that I make sure and get that right. Because it makes a difference. I, I'm, I don't consider myself Native American. I don't consider myself American Indian. I don't consider myself Indian. I consider myself, Anishinaabe and Ojibwe. And we, we talked about this a little bit earlier about how we identify, but that it, that says a lot because those are the words that my ancestors have spoken for years and years. And they didn't say they were Native Americans. So I'm gonna guess that probably all three of our other panelists might have similar feelings about uh, how they identify with them, with them 
how they themselves identify. Does anyone want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I I agree, and I think for that reason, like you were saying, the the rest of the terms, the external ones, really don't matter that much symbolically. So, like to me, they're they're pretty much interchangeable. Honestly, I think for most people, it's you know along um, generational lines usually, like which one they they prefer, like other non native people to call them. Um, but for me, I mean, they're all kind of interchangeable for that reason. You know, it, it's an external qualifier, so it doesn't really matter to me that much. Anyone else? Sure. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I identify as Diné, which is uh, in Navajo the way we call ourselves the people. Um, because Navajo actually is a Spanish derivative. Um, being more specific, I am Laguna Sun Clan, born for Totichitni. Um, Totichitni being the Navajo word for bitter water clan. So um, as Ron mentioned, a lot of our communities are matrilineal. So that's why my main clan is the Laguna Sun Clan. Um, but, you know, if, if I were to... Um, do the proper introduction, um, I would, uh, I, the proper Navajo introduction, I would introduce myself in terms of four um, sets of grandparents. I would honor all the clans that kind of comprise who I am. Uh, part of my identity is also where I come from on the reservation, which is Oak Springs chapter, it's Oak Springs community, which if you're Diné, if you're Navajo, you know what agency that is, you know what community. Um, and, you know, there's there's an identity, there's a Navajo identity attach, attached to the local places on the reservation. So again, that's how we tease each other, that's how we uh, make fun of each other. And, um, you know, we always say, so such and such community or regions um, jokes or coyote stories are the accurate ones because we're always, you know, trying to give each other a hard time in terms of that that cultural identity. Uh, well said. So many coyote stories. So many. Um, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so I I uh, identify as a Quetzon man uh, of the water. A good tribe is of the water um, and. Uh, we are a little, we're a very small tribe. There's only about 22 to 2,500 of us, depending on the count. So there aren't many left. Um, there are 91 um, uh, Quetzon speakers left in the world, uh, and they'll be gone pretty soon. Uh, and it happens very fast. And language is another topic that we can go down. But, um, you know, it, it's a tough, I won't do it because it will, this will take us off in another place. But I will add this. I've been asked the question, uh, and and again, I'm 53. This is not a generational topic. This is an indigenous topic I'm about to share with you. And that is the pronouns that you use. I always get a laugh out of that. And the reason I get a laugh out of it is because when you're an indigenous person, you just are who you are. You're, 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 you're part of a bigger group. So identifying yourself with such specificity doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, there are people who would disagree with me on that, and that's okay. But I say that because the identifying yourself truly is very difficult to do when your entire makeup is part of a communal uh, collectivism. We are collectivist people. Therefore, who I am is irrelevant. It's who we are. So the pronouns don't mean anything. So I hope that makes sense. And again, I'm not trying to jab too hard, but I also am trying to make you a little bit uncomfortable because that conversation is a conversation that we all stand mightily on when in reality, the topic is much bigger. The topic is much bigger, and that is what I call a shiny star. That's somebody in the corner doing a shiny star, and you're paying attention to the shiny star and not what actually is going on over here. So that's just one of those topics and connects perfectly with identification. And what Dr. Sheffield is saying reminds me of something that many people say in Indian country is, is that I'm not indigenous or I'm not Ojibwe because I say I'm Ojibwe. I'm Ojibwe because my community says I'm Ojibwe. There's good and bad with that, but that's kind of the way things are. I, I'm Ojibwe because they claim me. So. Any other 
audience questions? Um, yeah, there's a question in the chat. They said, um, please let me know if this is inserting my whiteness into your story. That's not my intention. And the question is, do you have any direction for white people or people of other cultures who want to uplift Native voices and learn more? Yes, read, interact with Native people. And a lot of people might say, well, there's no Native, there aren't any Native Americans. There are, there are no Indigenous people in the area I'm at. I'm going to bet that there are. There, they might not be in your neighborhood right there in, in the back door or the front door, but they're, they're around. And as you read, you're going to probably change your perspective on things and it's going to be really important to everyone, not just native people, not just indigenous people, but to non indigenous people as well. It's going to be really important that you be vocal about that and share what you've learned. Encourage other people to read what you've read. Take it upon yourself to have reading groups, to have discussions because America is not going to change for the better unless we have these difficult discussions about culture, about people, about our communities, and we have to make attempts to improve and, and change. And democracy is not something that we just get and it just stays. It's being threatened all the time and it doesn't take another country to do it. We, we can we, we do a good job of. Of. Skating on thin ice all all on our own. Yeah, I think the first and important step, like you were saying, is, is learning, right? Like you were saying with reading, but also just, just listening. And, you know, there are absolutely Native people in your community somewhere. You know, um, for example, you know, here at UGA, I'm sure, you know, the past couple of years when there wasn't a Native student group and there wasn't Native programming on campus, I'm sure people thought the same thing. I'm sure people thought there were none here. But we've been here, you know, and our, our members uh, are actually mostly, you know, juniors and seniors who have actually been here quite a while. Um, so they're absolutely in your community. They're in your university somewhere. Find them, listen to them, speak with them, um, and then take what you learn and do something with it. I think that's the simplest action plan. Um, and that that's really important, you know. I think, like I said earlier, it's also important to learn about the history of the land you're on um because that like, like we've said and this has been kind of a recurring theme is that influences everything really you know it influences you know how how your community began to exist how the university existed um the ways you got to where you are physically and culturally um so yeah i think the first step is to learn seek out these people that you can learn from and then put it into action Michelle, please. I, I would say that I, I don't think pity is necessarily helpful or constructive. Um, certainly, I think acknowledging uh, indigenous history is important. And Maximilian, of course, talks about, you know, Georgia and, and that history. And sometimes that is tough to, to read and understand. And especially if you're having, um, you know, people from a diverse uh, community kind of talking about that history. I think we've been politically, we've been in an interesting space in the last two years in terms of our country having a conversation about race relations and history. Um, and, you know, I, I think, again, through my teaching, sometimes I encounter students who are very, very well meaning, but bring a lot of um, sadness and pity to the conversation in terms of feeling bad for indigenous people. And, um, you know, again, I think it's important to acknowledge that history, but let's not dwell on it so much that we're forgetting to appreciate all the positives, the fact that our communities have survived, that we're resilient, that, you know, even in the light uh, of language loss um, and some of the damage of boarding schools um, that, you know, there's survivance in all of that, in that um, I think, again, because so many of the stereotypes are negative 
um, it's helpful to remember and talk about some of the positives that are happening in tribal communities with regard to um, you know, some of the great things that we're doing either culturally or educationally. Um, and this is where, again, I think some of the work being done now in sustainability with this new appreciation for um, traditional knowledge and uh, an appreciation for indigenous ways of, of, you know, interacting with the environment, all that is positive. And I think it's, for us, I feel like it's uplift, uplifting because it's that chance to not get you know, stuck in that um, groove of negativity ourselves in terms of some of the things that we want to celebrate about our communities. And I think that also, um, you know, taking that approach keeps us from dwelling too much on the past. Again, we certainly don't want to forget it. We want to acknowledge it, but we also want to acknowledge that there's a future. You know, let's let's put something positive in place now so that there's a positive future out there on the horizon. I, I might have this wrong, but my I think and and guilt is not the same emotion as pity, but I think I think it was Maya Angelou that who said guilt is a wasted emotion. So we would all probably rather you do something than just feel bad. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. I'll be brief. Uh, young people in the audience. Every social movement that you want to hop on and that you're passionate about, I want you to look around the room and make 100% sure that there is a, an enrolled tribal member in the room. Because every discussion you have while on this dirt, it started with us. Every single one of them. LGBTQ movement. Tribes everywhere have always honored those among us who have fit into that category. Have always, for thousands of years, they're the most special people in our tribe. To become who you are and to manifest that outwardly for what you are on the inside has been a respected thing for most tribes across this country forever. And so so please, everything that you've decided to hang your hat on and say, this is the thing that I'm going to care about, this is the thing that I'm going to fight about and make sure everybody knows, make 100% sure that you look around the room and go find an enrolled tribal member to be part of that conversation. That's my only takeaway and the one thing I'd like for you to do. How about one more? I, I think we were to last till eight o'clock. So do we have one more question from the audience? And if not, we'll just each go around. Oh, is there? Um, what I can tell, no, I don't think so. <laughs> OK, okay. Uh, how about we just each one of us have a little clo closing comment or two since we're running out of time. So we'll start with Max. Oh man, putting me on the spot. Put you on the spot, um, Max. Yeah. Um, it's like an exam. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, closing statements. I think I think we've discussed a lot of important things today, and I think the really the key takeaway is the the question we just answered. Honestly, it's how do we take what we just discussed and what you just heard and learned about and put it into action. I think that that is the takeaway. That is the closing remark is what we just said, honestly. Um, go do that. Do the things that we suggested, honestly. I mean, that, there's nothing else that I can tell you that's gonna help you more. Dr. Hale? Yes, and, and you know, I, I wanna echo something Ron said about being sure to include in, enrolled citizens from our communities. And I, I think if, if we learned anything from from the pandemic and kind of being locked down at home was that these new ways of communicating, I mean, even this fact that I'm participating with you all um, is really something that we're having this conversation together um, uh, because, you know, there are just so many new ways of communicating and sharing ideas with each other that um, you know, that doesn't mean that some of what we're doing here at Arizona State University can't be accessible to you all. I mean, a lot of our events are on Zoom. They're open to the public. So why not? You know, there's the, wel the welcome mat is out. So I know the um, academic year is winding down quickly, but 
um, you know, if there's a way we can all keep in touch, I mean, we do a lot of um, activities here on campus. So if anybody in the room is interested in learning about Southwest tribes, we do a lot of Navajo and Thana Autumn um, work here. Um, you know, by all means, join us on Zoom um, at some point. You're always welcome to, to our community events. That's a good way to kind of actualize some of uh, the work that we've been talking about today. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. I, I think the, the thing I'd like to leave you with, a couple points. Um, I, I was realizing, I'm looking in the camera and I see the little cardinal on my lapel here. And, and I was literally going through this in my head when we were on this call today. I've worked at a ton of places in my corporate life for a lot of big companies. And uh, one of my first jobs was I was an F-15 electrician, the fighter jet, the F-15. I was an electrician um, and, and um, very cool job, by the way, very cool job. Uh, don't like working for the government, but very cool job. Um, and the thing I, I walked away from that was I have a shirt that I still have, by the way, it's threadbare and it's, it's, an, it's an F-15. But the reason I have that shirt is because behind it is an eagle because it's the F-15 eagle. And it just dawned on me that it, all the jobs I've ever had, I've only ever worn the logo of two things. One was that eagle and the second was this cardinal. So the, the bird songs mean a lot. So the only thing I would take away from that is that I didn't even realize that I had done this until I saw my reflection in this camera today. The thing I would walk kind of take away is, um, is please, 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 please just be kind. Just be kind. That's the only thing to me that I'd ever and I have ever really spoken to students about is you can have a position, you can have, you know, you can, you, you don't know this term probably, but you can get on your soapbox, you can stand on it and, you know, you can preach the thing of the world. You can and people will listen. But when you get off the soapbox, just please be kind. Because collectivism and the idea of indigeneity, indigenous people, we are here thousands of years later because of this, because of connecting with one another, not because we did some wonderful thing on our own out here. It's because we connected and kept each other safe and kept each other going. So that would be my only takeaway that I hope that you walk away from this with. Thank you. Thank you. I'll add that I hope that tomorrow or the next day when you're in your classes, you can find a way to bring something up that we talked about today and share it with someone else, your family members, your friends, partners. And yes, we did talk about being uncomfortable and how that causes us to change and grow in a better way. But we also want to thank you all so incredibly very, very much for taking an, an evening out to come and listen to us and share your questions and sit there so nice and politely and just be there. That means a lot. It's how things get started. And we just appreciate and are very grateful for you for coming here today. And I'm also grateful for Max, Dr. Sheffield, and Dr. Hale. Thank you so much for your evening too.